to be reading from the record of the Windsor Church of God. The first entry was made in 1861. I'd like to share one written in 1940. Saturday noon, we, Reverend Ensminger and family, moved into the parsonage. There were a few here from the church to welcome us. Mr. H. S. Herman took us out to the church so we would know where it was Sunday morning. There is a nice little church by the side of the road, but far too small to accommodate the congregations that gather there for worship. The years have passed, some of them very gray. Indeed, war years, years in which we saw our young men march away to war. <coughs> Families were separated by miles and death. It wasn't easy to keep faith because our boy did not come home. It wasn't easy to keep the church together, but the spirit of the mighty one <coughs> prevailed and we were permitted to see the church and Bible school grow. We have done nothing spectacular, but we have witnessed the power of God in the salvation of souls, and we have prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is done in heaven. Written by Reverend J.D. Ensminger. Amen. 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 does a lot of uh, nursing home programs, or did a lot of nursing home programs just like we do, and there, uh, you haven't been out for a while, haven't you, Carrie? Nope. I didn't think so, we haven't either. He's married, uh, he goes to different churches, and he preaches, and he uh, attends High Mountain United Methodist Church. Is there anything else I need to know about you? Other than the Brad Pitt look-alike contest winner, why no, it's fun. <laughs> okay, I can take care of <laughs> Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, folks, for your service to Word for Our Country. Now, I talked to Roland last night, and uh, I said, it's been a long time since I've been to this church. I said, I thought I was fired. <laughs> and uh, I said, but just to help me remember, I said, do these people like to have a good time? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, okay, good. Because I have been into some stuffy churches already. Um, I, I might have mentioned one time before I was, uh, when I was here last time, um, I was singing in New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, I did three church services up there in one morning. Uh, did a church service, spoke and sang, and traveled to another church, spoke and sang, and traveled to another church and spoke and sang. And um, every single church opened their hymnal with, or opened their service with the same song. And it was called Stand Up For Jesus. And I know you guys know this, it's stand up, stand up, oh Jesus. And every one of them <laughs> sang it like this. Stand up, stand up, oh Jesus. Soldiers of the cross. I thought, holy smokes. In two minutes, everybody's going to be sitting there either bobbing for apples or looking for airplanes if they keep this. This sort of stuff, I thought, wait, they get a load of me. I thought, it's okay to have a good time in church. It's not a punishment, it's a celebration. And we have what everybody wants, and we're going where everybody wants to go. Amen. So it's okay, the Lord has a sense of humor. After all, look at the size of the ears that he gave me. So you know, he has a, he has a sense of humor. Now, when you think of, in, our, in church, when you think of rock and roll, Usually you think of Rock of Ages, and when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Which is okay, but there's a lot more to it than that. Now there are some opinions that make me shake my head. They think that God's a waste of time, his passion is misread. Those folks think that Christians are boring, dull, and slow. I always try to tell them something they don't know. Here we go! I know 
37 years. Now, I am not a veteran, but looking back over those 37 years, I kind of feel like one, uh, <laughs> if you get my drift, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Now, in honor of the vets, I went back through and picked some, oh, and by the way, he told me, I said, well, how, how soon do you want me done? What's the time limit? He said, you can do what you want to do. He said, we'd like to have everybody out by five. So I said, okay, we'll work on that. Um, I'd like to do, I went back over and I did, I found some patriotic songs that I think would be good to sing this morning and have a good time. If you feel like singing along with me, fine, it's not a problem. So here we go. We're going to go back to 1840. In 1840, a lot of people were singing this song. Shrine of each patron's devotion, a world of 
pledge to sing. Oh, the mandates may give us a symbol when liberties stand in the view. And thy banners they tear and they tremble when born of the red, white, and blue. And now we're going to go to 1906. And in 1906, for the first time, there were a lot of people singing this song. Here we go. Acres away, my boys, acres away. Farewell to college joys we sail at break of day through our last night on shore. Dream to the bone until we meet once more. Here's wishing you a happy voyage home. I did tell Rowan last night when he was having his trouble um, with his um, getting ready for his biopsy and uh, all that sort of stuff and his anxiety. And I said, well, I could probably go get you about a half a dozen case of beers and three fists of Jack Daniels to bring it over for you. I'd probably cure your anxiety. <laughs> That'd probably cure everything, I think. <laughs> and now we're going to 1917. We have World War One. That's exactly right. And you were hearing this song. Over that, over that, send the word, send the word over that, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums run tumbling everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word to beware. We'll be over. songs know these songs okay that's good now you youngsters who don't know them well you ought to know them here we go in 1929 1929 a lot of people started singing this song from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli we will fight our Country's battles on the land and on the sea. First to fight for right and freedom, and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of the United States. Woo! You guys are good, man. Nice job. I'll have you singing at the Giant Center next weekend. <laughs> That's a good thing. And now at night, we're going to 1938. 1938. And people began to sing this song. to 1947. 1947. And people are starting to sing this song. Oh, better tune this, fix this right here. Off we go into the wild blue yonder flying high into the sun. But here they come Thunder, had a boys, give him the gun. That out with eyes, spouting a flame from under. Off 
I don't want to take up too much time because I do want to give the message. How many of you have ever seen, this is ending on the fun of it, how many of you have ever seen the musical um, uh, White Christmas? It was also called Holiday Inn, Bing Crosby and Danny Kay and stuff like that. Well, there was a song in there that I thought was great. And I'm going <laughs> to close up, or, well, maybe I'll do one more after this. And I'll close up, I'll cut that message a little short. And I'll close up uh, with this song from that movie that goes like this. And this is for all you vets. goes like this. When I was mustered out, I thought without a doubt that I was through with all my care and strife. I thought that I was then the happiest of men, but after months of tough civilian life, oh gee, I wish it was back in the army. The army wasn't really bad at all. Three meals a day for which it didn't pay. Uniforms for spring and winter fall. Oh, there's a lot to be said for the army. A life without responsibility. A soldier out of luck was never really stuck. There's always something higher up where he can pass the buck. Oh, gee, I wish you was back in the army. And now I'm going to do, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to do one more because now comes 1956. And in 1956, we have many people singing this song. for all you have done. And thank you, veterans coming up, for all you will do. My wonderful wife, Krista, when I'm a, since I'm a retired high school teacher, my wife, Krista, who everybody calls Doc, is a, I don't think I announced this, is a graduate nursing research professor at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And we have no children by choice, but we do have a cat. <laughs> And now I find myself third in command uh, in the house because the cat is most certainly first. And then Doc is second, and I take <laughs> orders from those two ladies. And that's the way I guess it should be. Now, <clears throat> we're going to talk today, and if you want me to, I'll try to stay in one place. You're good. I, I usually yeah. walk around a lot, but I'll, I don't want you mad at me. <laughs> now, we're going to read a little bit from the Bible and I'm going to talk a little bit. And when I'm talking a little bit, you're going to think, what the heck does this have to do with Veterans Day? Sorry, with Veterans Day. <clears throat> and I will explain it to you before too long. I'm going to read, and you don't have to follow, I'll read it to you. I'm reading from Acts 9. Acts 9, um, 36 to 40. <clears throat> and it goes like this. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick, and she died. Oh, excuse me. Whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men declaring him, that he would not delay, that's the key word, that words, that he would not delay, and uh, 
lost my spot. Oh, not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing their coats and garments, which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, those of you who know me, Know that I am a diehard, diehard, diehard bow hunter. I don't hunt with guns or crossbows or gadget bows. I hunt with stick bows, recurves and long bows, just a stick and a string. And I hunt everything with a stick and a string. I hunt bear, I hunt antelope, I hunt squirrels, I hunt deer, I hunt everything with just a stick and a string. And so far this archery season, I've got nothing. <laughs> but I got two weeks yet, so we'll see if I can find a dumb one somewhere. I don't shoot no, but maybe I can find a dumb buck. Well, I was on an elk hunting trip in Colorado with a friend of mine whose name's Barry Neese. And we were out there and we were way back in the mountains in the wilderness in a camp. And it was Barry and myself two guides and a wonderful lady probably in her upper or lower 80s maybe who was the camp cop and i went out the guide dropped me off and i went out by myself i said i don't need a guide just put me in an area and i can find my own way around and lo and behold i killed an elk and i was so excited and i walked the whole way back into camp and i got there and i couldn't wait to tell everybody about my elk well they were just getting ready to have supper and i come in and uh, Barry said, I didn't see anything. I said, I got an elk. So we're going to have to go get it. And oh, it was great. But the one guy who we'll call Dave, we'll call him that because that's his name. And we'll call him Dave. He was in the top bunk, bunk with the bunk bed. And he didn't move. And they were getting supper ready, and we were getting supper ready and stuff. And I said, Come on, Dave, I want to tell you about my elk. And he didn't move. And Barry went over to him and he shook him and he said, Dave, and he didn't move. And Barry looked at him and he looked over and he said, does he have diabetes? And he said, yes. Did he eat today? And they said, yes. No. What is it, honey? His insulin. Yes. Oh, did he eat today? No. Did he take his insulin? Yes. And he said, well, he's in, di in a diabetic coma. And Barry went over to him and grabbed him instantly. Bam, Barry was all over it. He went over and grabbed him by the shirt. He said, why did he get his feet? And yanked him out of the bed and I grabbed his feet and was boom, right on the floor. And Barry said, get him a Snickers bar. And he went over, I said, I was like, <laughs> you know, I don't know any of this stuff. I didn't know what to do. And I went over and grabbed his Snicker bar and gave it to Barry. And Barry mushed it all up, mushed it all up, mushed it all up and stuffed it in his throat. And he started massaging it, massaging it, massaging it. And after a while, you could see him swallow. He said, give me some more. And he gave him some more. And I'm, I'm still like, <laughs> and he said, go get, the, go, get, go get some orange juice. And he grabbed some orange juice, brought it over, and he poured it down his throat. And he started doing this. He said, this is what we do with our horses when he won't take medicine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> He got it down and got it down, and all of a sudden, Dave kind of looks around a little bit. And uh, the one guy, the other guy, said, He needs an ambulance. I'm going to town to get an ambulance. I said, It's two and a half hours one way to town. He said, I'll be back with an ambulance, and he takes off. So now it's Barry, me, the cook, and Dave, who's just coming out of a diabetic coma. So Dave's starting to come around a little bit, come around a little, a little bit. And I went over and I sat there, I got him up on a chair and I sat there right aside of him and I said, are you, um, are you all right? He said, are you my grandpa? <laughs> I said, sure, I'll be your grandpa. And he goes, then why are you trying to kill me? <laughs> oh man. 
When I look at Barry, and Barry moves over closer to the door. And I'm sitting right aside of this guy. And I said, I'm not trying to kill you. And he, I said, are you hungry? I thought, get, you know. He goes, I am. I said, I'll make you a sandwich. He said, okay. So I made him a sandwich quick. And I'm sitting, like if Doc is David, I'm sitting here. He's here, and I'm sitting right here. And there's a, a big cook stove here. And I'm sitting right aside of him. I mean, I don't want him to keel over and crack his head or anything. But I'm sitting aside, and I give him his sandwich. And he eats his sandwich down, and then he has projectile vomiting all over me. <laughs> Just whoop, all over my face and down my shirt. And, blah, blah, blah. and he goes, why are you trying to kill me? And I, and I look over. Now Barry's at the door. He's right at the door frame. And the door's open. And there I am sitting beside him. And he goes, do you, do you care if I sleep, Grandpa? No, no, you go ahead and sleep. You, you go ahead and sleep. Rock my baby on it. You know, you go ahead and sleep. So he lays his head down a little bit like this. And I look over. And on this skillet, or on this uh, stove, is a big cast iron skillet. And he's sleeping. And I look at this skillet. And I reach over and get it. And then I practice. Because I thought, buddy, I noticed that on his side, he's got a great big knife. And I thought, buddy, if you stand up and you pull that knife on me, I'm going to introduce you to the Lord. I'm going to, I was practicing, so I had the right distance with this skillet. Because I'm going to wail you, buddy, if you stand up and pull that knife. And then I look over and Barry's out the door. Because <clears throat> I had said to him, he's got a knife. And Barry's out the door. So here I am. Now, he comes up a little bit and he looks at the camp cook and he said some very vulgar things to her. So she leaves, goes over to her trailer and locks herself in and it's Barry out the door, the one guy on the way to town for an ambulance, the camp cook's locked in her trailer and I'm sitting here with puke all over me. With this, I said, who else does this happen to in the world? And I got the skillet ready and he goes back to sleep again. After a while, he wakes up and he looks at me and he goes, Whitey, did you get an elk? I said, I did. And he was fine. And he said, what's all over you? I said, buddy, that's you. <laughs> I said, and I, we told, Barry came back in, and the gutless wonder. He came back in. I went and got the cook. He came back and we told him what had happened. Oh my gosh, he couldn't believe it. He was just out of control, just out of control, bawling and crying and stuff, blah, blah, blah. Now, we fed him, told him the story of the elk, everything was fine. He was sitting there chatting and stuff. He kept saying to me, Whitey's, thank you for saving my life. I said, Bleh. it wasn't me, buddy, it was Barry. I said, I'm ready to take your life. I said, it was Barry who knew what to do. Bam! He was on that without delay. Bam! He was all over it. Now, I said, he's the one. He took care of it with that stuff swallowing, a horse swallowing stuff. He was all over. He saved your life. Well, hours later, the guy comes back with an ambulance. And they come in, and I said, where were you? You left us here by yourself, blah, 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 by ourselves. Blah. He said, I had to get an ambulance. So they come in, and Dave's sitting there, and he's fine. He's sitting there talking to her, visiting. I'm telling about my help. we got to go get the help. So the ambulance driver said, we ought to take him down to town. Yes, I agree. So they put him in the ambulance and they take him down to town. We get my elk. We go and get my elk. And the next day, Dave and his girlfriend come back up. And he's got cards for Barry and I. Thank you, cards. Oh, sorry. And, uh, sorry. Just the way I am in front of my ninth grade classes and 10th grade classes and 11th grade classes, I'm always roaming around. So, uh, he comes up and he has cards and he's crying and he says thanks and the girlfriend's crying and said thank you Whitey. I didn't do anything buddy. Barry's the one who did it because he was all over that. All over that in a second. Now what does that have to do with the vets? Okay here's our Bible story. I like to talk about in the Bible obscure people. Who you don't hear of every day. I know you hear Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, blah, 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 and all that, Elisha, which is great. But I love, and, and I do love the um, Gospels where you hear people who you never really hear much of. 
And sometimes you hear them in other Gospels. And today we're here going to hear one about Acts, from Acts. <clears throat> a lady by the name of Tabitha. And uh, you know what happened with Peter. He was there. Okay. Now we're going to look at another lady by the name of Abigail. Abigail. I never knew anything about Abigail until I started reading this information. Well, here's what happened. Saul was very angry at David. He was jealous of David. And he wanted to kill David. And he was chasing David. And David and his men were running. Da -da 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 -da, and Saul was after him. Now, Abigail was married to a real jerk. A real idiot. His name was Nadab. And he was rich, rich. But he was evil and he was cruel. <clears throat> and he was mean and blah, blah, blah. I don't know ever how she ever got hooked up with him. Some people say that about my wife, but I'm just... <laughs> thank you, dear. Um, David, running from Saul, saw all these sheep. And these men were having trouble with it. Well, he finds out that this is Nadal's sheep and Nadal's men. So David takes his men and goes in and helps Nadal. The Nadal's men control the sheep. And they get it all under control. So after he, after he does that, his men don't have a lot of food and beverage and stuff. So David finds out about Nadal and David goes to Nadal. And he said, my men helped you out taking care of your sheep. Could you give us some beverage, some wine, some meat and stuff for my men? <clears throat> and Nadal says, ha, huh, who do you think you are? How dare you come? and talk to me, and practically spit in David's face. Well, this didn't go over very well with David. So he goes back to his men and he says, come on, get your swords, we're gonna go, we're gonna kill Nadal and all the people in his house because how he disrespected us. Now, Nadal's wife Abigail finds out about this. And Abigail, bam, takes off without delay and goes to David. Goes out and asks permission to speak to David. She brings with her her servants and meat and wine and everything, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't wait around, doesn't screw around. Bam, she's all over. And she goes to David and she tells David, please do not kill my husband. It will be a big mistake on your part to take revenge like this. His name is Nadal, which really means fool. And he lives up to his name. And... David is so impressed with this lady's caring, even for her husband the way he is, and her righteousness, and everything like that, that he said, thank you. Thank you for stopping me from making a huge mistake in my life. And he puts everything down, and Abigail goes back. They give the, they give, she gives the meat and everything. Then she goes back to Nadal and tells Nadal what she has done. He can't believe it. Rah, 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 rah. He can't believe it. Blah, 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 blah. Ten days later, Nadal dies. Lord, I guess the Lord had about enough of him. And Nadal dies and leaves Abigail a widow. Well, when David hears about this and how wonderful Abigail is and how caring and compassionate she is, he's all over it. He flies right over to Abigail and he asks her to marry. marry him. And she does. And they have a wonderful life together. Now, wrapping this all up, because I know some of you are watching your watches. And I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to hold it too long because I know the meat and potatoes are ready. I know what you mean. <laughs> These all worked because there was no delay. They didn't screw around. They didn't screw. Peter did not screw around with Tabitha. They asked him to come. But he's up and he's all over. Barry did not screw around with Dave. Bam. He's up. Grab him. We pull him out. They bam. Got the snickers. Blah, blah, blah. Shove it in his throat. Blah, blah, blah. And Dave comes around and he saves Dave's life. Because he didn't delay. He's all over it. Abigail. <clears throat> she's all over it. She stops what could have been a tragic event in David's life, all because she didn't screw around and fool around. What does this have to do with the U.S. military and the veterans? When the U.S. military and the veterans are needed, bam, they're all over it. 
Now I know guys hear about the, the, the hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait, and all that stuff. But you're still there and you are still on guard. And we thank you for this. And we thank you for being at the ready and all over it to protect so, so many lives. Thank you. Remember, uh, Peter, remember Barry and Dave, remember Abigail, and certainly remember the United States military veterans. Thank you very much for having me today.